podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. There's really just two ways to live, believing in your dreams or not believing in your dreams. Valeria Tellez interviews Carl McCoy, the author of Job Hunter Road, comedy and self-help on the path to finding a job. Comic relief and inspiration on the road to success. Laugh out loud satire and soulful advice come together in one of the most original, funniest, genre-bending self-development books you'll ever read. With sharp and irreverent humor, Job Hunter Road provides timely comic relief to job seekers while tackling some serious questions about finding work today. Why don't more people love their jobs? Why do we make it so hard to change careers? Why do we require unnecessary and expensive degrees for everything? What does it take to be an entrepreneur? Does networking have to be so ugly and opportunistic? What stops us from reaching our career potential? Journey down an unpredictably quirky highway of laughter as you encounter opera-loving cats, crocodile-hunting terriers, and levitating job seekers on the road to self-empowerment. Carl McCoy's writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal and the Christian Science Monitor. He studied political science at Tufts University and Pembroke College, Oxford University. After completing his graduate degree at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C., Carl moved to the San Francisco Bay Area and started up his own successful private piano teaching practice. He now lives in Boston and spends his time writing, playing piano in a band, and teaching English to international college students. His book, Job Hunter Road, is a humorously honest account of what it takes to go beyond the 9 to 5 daily grind and to reclaim a passionate and unstoppable career by the force of your own will. Meet Carl at McCoyWriting.com. Here is the interview with Carl McCoy. In your own words, who is Carl McCoy? Oh, God, I love that question. So, so I'm a writer. I'm a writer, um, husband, husband, son, um, and I think I'm I'm a seeker. You know, I'm 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 a student. You know, I'm not a spiritual teacher. I'm I'm just trying to figure it out as I go, just like everybody else. I don't have all the answers, but I'm very I'm very honest with myself. You know, I'm, I'm very non-defensive. My wife says I'm like the most non-defensive person she ever met. So, you know, I don't get too attached to my opinions, too attached to my writing. I write, I try to write what I feel is true. You know, in that moment, I try to be very, very honest in my writing. But, you know, I don't have all the answers and I'm, I'm just trying to find truth. You know, that's what I've been doing my whole life. And I, I find writing to be a great vehicle for, you know, for exploring what I believe to be true. And, and I just, I love to be honest in my writing, but I certainly don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm just a seeker, you know, like everybody else. Yeah, I hear that sometimes about being a seeker. I often ask, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? What am I seeking? Contentment, peace, you know, happiness, 
you know, just like everybody else, you know, I am becoming more and more aware of the, the sort of spiritual essence as, you know, so many of us are now. I think there's this, you know, great awakening happening all over the world. And, you know, we're becoming less identified with our roles, you know, as, you know, husband, father, you know, son, you know, writer, whatever. And I think we're, we are becoming more aware of the I am within us, the spiritual essence, you know. Um, but I, I do think that in some cases, you know, um, a lot of the spiritual traditions today, and um, like I'm thinking of, like, for example, Eckhart Tolle, who I just love so much. I really love him. He's helped me so much. But I think if you only uh, listen to him, it can be taken too far. And the focus is too much on the being, too much on the I am. And you can you can kind of lose the focus on the human aspect, you know. The roles that we play, they are important. It matters. You know, we came into this world in these flesh bodies to have experiences, to have jobs, to have relationships. And those things really do matter. You know, so, of course, I am, you know, aware of my essence you know, as a spiritual being, as an entity. I'm trying to become more aware of that every day. But um, I think you can take that too far and it can almost become too passive, too translucent, you know, because I think it really does matter. It really matters our jobs and our relationships and our dreams, you know, our desires, what we want out of this life. We, we came into these bodies to have experiences and those things are important. It's not just to realize our I amness, it's to realize our humanity too, you know? And I think it's so important to find that contentment. I think desire is a good thing. Desire is a normal and natural thing and to fulfill those desires is part of our experience, you know, on this, on this world. Spirituality, what is it to you, Carl? Do we need to practice to do certain things in a certain way to be spiritual? I think for me, spirituality is, it is when you, you let go of yourself, you know, it is, I think, transcending your thoughts, transcending your ego. And I think of finding that balance between the human, the humanity, and, you know, the role that you play and the being, your spiritual essence, that's what it's all about. And yeah, the, for me, the spirituality comes through when I can just take a breath, <laughs> like I'm doing, <laughs> and just let go of myself, you know, not not think about myself, um, not think so much, you know, when you rise above your thoughts, and that's what I've really learned from, from Eckhart Tolle and, and other spiritual teachers like him, is to just let go of me for a while, let go of the ego, and just to rise above the thoughts. You know, it, it shocked me when I read his book, The Power of Now, and I was, I, I just never, the idea that thinking is not consciousness, like that thinking is one tiny tributary in the ocean of consciousness, you know, that was shocking to me because I always thought thinking was consciousness. I, I didn't realize that like, oh my gosh, there's this whole other level of consciousness that has nothing to do with thinking. Like that just blew my mind, you know? And so when you, when you can get into that, tap into that other realm, you know, to stop thinking, um, all this incessant, useless, repetitive thinking sometimes right. that we torture ourselves <laughs> with our thoughts, you know, to rise above those thoughts and to just be, I think that is for me, that's, that's spirituality. And, and that's what I love about art, you know, whether it's writing or music, it's, it's, it's a place to be in that space where, you can just stop being yourself for a while and you just tap into something bigger, you know? What is there that replaces thoughts in a sense of inspiration? Would you say imagination, dreams, or intuition? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think something higher than thoughts, you know, imagination, vibration, feelings, emotions, I think those are higher, you know? Um, I love that about, you know, music and and, and the arts is that it, it, you don't need the intermediary of thoughts. You need, you know, you, you go into this place where I don't know what it is. It's vibrations, it's feelings, intuitions, pulses, something that it doesn't, it, you can't always put it into, into words. And that's a magical place. I, and I love to be there when yeah. I can, you know. Right, right. No labels. Yeah, no judgment. Exactly, exactly. And I love what you said about being here in a human body. It, we all have a purpose in our jobs. They are connected to it. What we yes. do relates to that purpose. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll be talking about that more specifically in a moment. Those are topics in your book, Job Hunter Road, Comedy and Self-Help on the Path of Finding a Job. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The other uh, warm up questions for you is about success. How do you define success these days? What is to be successful? It's just to be happy, really. I think that that's what it is, you know, and that's no small 
uh, feet in this world. You know, I think it's so elusive sometimes and we create so many barriers, usually from our own minds. You know, you can have all the fortune in the world. You can have all the friends in the world. You can have all your dreams come true, but you're not necessarily going to be happy, you know. Um, so just to be happy for me, that's that's success. And it, it doesn't take much. I think it's mostly an inward journey, you know, to, to break down the, the barriers that keep you from being happy. So that that's, to me, is success, just, just to be happy, just to enjoy the day, you know, to be appreciative of all the little miracles, all the little things, you know, just having a cup of coffee. <laughs> I love coffee. <laughs> but, um, you know what I mean? Like all these yeah. little things oh, that yeah. you can take for granted. And when you step out the mind, you step out of all that, that sort of repetitive thinking and just be in the moment. And it's so, yeah, there's so many miracles, you know. Um, just so many things and just the everyday life, you know, just shopping, you know, just going to sleep, all these little things, you know, um, that to me is to be happy, to be aware of that, to be in that field of consciousness where, you know, everything is a miracle. Um, then I'm really happy with that. And you said now many times the thoughts, the, um, in a way, uh, patterns, they repeat themselves. There's nothing new about I mean, sometimes when it comes from inspiration, from intuition, imagination, but most of the time it's just uh, useless. Yes. I mean, for me, I, you know, I, I, it's like, you know, 90% of my thoughts, are, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not new, they're not original. You know, you have, to, you, have to, you have to do something for exercise, whatever, music, take a shower, and then boom, you get these uh, new thoughts, you know, new ideas, of, you know, inspiration. I think it's the same for everybody. It's when you can stop that repetitive thinking and go into that deeper dimension. Yeah. yeah. How did you become a musician, Carl? Well, um, so yeah, I always loved um, I always loved music and I always loved um, piano. I, I actually didn't start um, playing the piano till I was 22 because I thought it was too difficult for me. I thought it was too hard. I just thought, oh my God, you have to use two hands, you know, and like read the bass clef and the treble clef. I thought I could never do that. And then I took chemistry when I was in college because I was, I was pre-med for a while. And after I took chemistry, I was like, okay, I can do chemistry. I can do anything. <laughs> True. <laughs> Especially organic chemistry. It was so hard. And I, I just had to be so diligent. And I was like, okay, I'm going to apply the same self-discipline to the piano. So when I finished college uh, and I started to, to, you know, study on my own, and then I was very lucky. I had this wonderful, wonderful piano teacher. Her name is um, Brenda Hopkins Miranda. She's from Puerto Rico. She's a jazz musician and just amazing soul, really kind person. I was so lucky to study with her because she had no ego, you know, really nice person, beautiful, you know, soul and a great artist, great musician and a kind teacher. And I studied with her for maybe two years and I just started, you know, I just loved it. You know, when you're an adult and you're doing it for yourself, um, you're just so much more motivated. I, I was practicing two hours a day. I was really disciplined with it. And um, I loved it so much. You know, I just, I love it. I still love it. And um, I had the idea that I wanted to start teaching it, you know, because I loved it so much. And I thought, well, you can't do that because I just, you know, you, you should start playing piano when you're five years old, you know. <laughs> but um, but no, I, I, I loved it so much and I made a lot of progress. And then um, when I was, 29 and I, I finished I finished graduate school this was crazy this was a crazy decision in my life because I had just gotten a master's degree in international relations and I you know I had spent like almost a hundred thousand dollars on this degree <laughs> but I, I I just it wasn't right for me you know I was in Washington DC and the culture was very aggressive very angry very divisive and it just wasn't right for me and I'd always dreamed of being a musician and so you know, when, a lot of people, when they're 29, they do crazy stuff, you know, it's like a, <laughs> so I, I, that's when I, I moved across the country, I moved to California, and I became a musician, I started teaching piano professionally, and it was absolutely crazy, I thought I was going insane, my friends told me, you know, you're throwing away your life, you know, you're not, you're not, you know, why don't you, you know, stay in Washington, do politics, you know, you just got this master's degree, but it just felt like I had to do this. I felt in my intuition, I just loved music. I loved it. And so the opportunity to do that full time, that was happiness. You know, when you, you, don't, you don't care if it's Monday because you're so happy to go to your job and every day was just fun. You know, it, I just loved it. And I loved sharing my love of music with, uh, with people, you know, and in California, they didn't care that I didn't have a master's degree. They didn't care that I had just, you know, I had started late. They just didn't care because they could see that I was skilled and they could see how much I loved it. 
And, you know, I, I taught mostly beginners. I wasn't qualified to teach advanced students, but the vast majority of, of piano students are beginners. So I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was my favorite job ever. I did it for four years, and that's how I met my wife. We worked at the same music studio, and it just opened up so many blessings in my life that continue to this day. It was the craziest thing I ever did, but it was also the best, best thing I ever did, you know? One of the topics you sent to me that's in your book is about giving less importance to advanced degrees and um, becoming more natural, more fluid, as you call it, you say it. So true. Why do you think most of us don't do that and live unhappily ever after with our jobs? Well, I think, unfortunately, we have a lot of very rigid, you know, egoic constructs. This is something I get from Eckhart Tolle's teachings is, you know, we all want to feel like what we're doing is difficult and important and specialized. You know, that makes us feel happy, you know. For example, right now I'm teaching English, English as a second language. And, you know, it's, it's a normal thing to be like, well, you know, this is so difficult. Nobody can, you know, you have to be, you know, highly qualified and specialized. You need a master's degree to do what I'm doing, you know, but you don't, you don't. I think we confuse complexity for value, you know. Um, things don't have to be complex to be valuable. You know, what I do as, a, as an ESL teacher, it's incredibly easy. You know, it's so easy. And, and, and yet it's still valuable. I, I don't know why that's a threat to people to say, you know, I think my job is easy. Uh, there are so many jobs that are easy, but they're still important. They're still so important. I mean, of course, there are some jobs like, you know, air traffic controller, pilot, surgeon. Those are not easy. And of course, you need advanced degrees for that. But I think so many other jobs, they're in this gray area, you know, um, social work, you know, um, uh, many types of teaching, uh, management, human resources, sales, advertising, you know, you don't really need a master's degree, if we can just be honest, you know, um, they're, they're, they're fairly easy, you know, and I know that's, that could be a threat to our egos. It's like, no, 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 my job is not easy. Uh, nobody can do my job, but, but, but it is, it's easy. So many jobs are easy. <laughs> they're still incredibly valuable. They're incredibly important, but they're easy. And if we can just admit that and say, okay, you, we don't really need all these silly advanced degrees, especially when they cost $200,000, you know, in my own job, you know, um, yeah, we, we had a workshop where, um, you know, the, the head of the, the CEA, that's the commission for English language accreditation, who, you know, they're responsible for accrediting all the language schools. And she was very proud of the fact that they were now requiring master's degrees, you know, for many programs for ESL. And of course, you know, ESL teachers, they don't earn very much. It's like working as a cashier, you know, at Whole Foods practically, or, you know, and so, um, to, and it's a very easy job. I think it's a very valuable, very important job. It means so much. It's like a, it's like a, you know, it's a very sort of spiritual experience to teach someone a language, but it's not difficult. You know, you can learn it in a couple of weeks, really. And, and I think that's a threat to people's ego. And so here she was saying that now you must have a master's degree to teach this job, you know, and, and that makes her feel good. It makes, you know, uh, the ESL profession feel good because, oh, yes, we are so difficult. We are so specialized. You know, you must have a master's degree. But I think it's so crazy because master's degrees cost, you know, they cost $100,000 or whatever. And, you know, you're earning $15 an hour. It, it's just terrible. And I think our job market could be so much more fluid if we just got rid of all this silly ego, you know, and said, you know what, there's so many jobs that are just easy, <laughs> that almost everybody can do. Yes, they require a couple of weeks of, you know, you know, you'll get better, an apprenticeship, whatever. But like, I mean, the vast majority of jobs, I think a lot of people could do them. And if we could just accept that and admit that, our job market would be so much more fluid, you know, so much more fluid. And I'm not talking about air traffic controllers, you know, but I am talking about so many jobs. And, and I think it's just our our rigid egos that, you know, that keep us from accepting that, you know, because we all want to feel so important and that it bothers me. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to get that off my chest. <laughs> and speaking of the ego, I know you mentioned that word too. So for those who don't know what that is exactly, what is the ego, Carl? Well, again, I get this from I, my f favorite spiritual <laughs> teachers are Eckhart Tolle and Neville Goddard. I love them both. I love them so much. And so, you know, I'm, I'm using the ego as, as um, Eckhart Tolle, you know, defines it in, in the power of now and a new earth. And it's, you know, it's identification with our roles, you know, losing yourself, forgetting your 
I am, you know, forgetting your higher self and thinking that you are, you know, I am a teacher, you know, I am this, and you know, I am so important, you know, and forgetting, no, 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 I, yes, that's the role I'm playing. But it's when you become identified with that role and it becomes very rigid. And um, so that to me is the ego. It's, it's forgetting who you are, you know, forgetting that you're, you're God, <laughs> you know, you're a spiritual being and, and you, you lose that. And, and then you, you become very rigid and you become, life becomes very scary and, you know, you've territorial and, and you know, that's why we're so, no, 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 I'm so important. My job, nobody can do my job, you know, because of course that's the ego. That's the ego talking. It's natural. We all want to be specialized. We all want to be smart. We all want to be accomplished. But I, you know, I think that's the ego speaking. It's, it's the identification with that role. What do you think the purpose of the human experience is as a whole? I think it's to create images, to have experiences, you know, and, and of course to love to love, yeah. you know, um, but to have experiences and to love, to love each other, you know, I think that's, that's what it's all about, you know, and for me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And for me, love is, is just identifying, seeing yourself, yourself and in, in the other, you know, and by yourself, I mean, the one consciousness, the one, the whole, the totality, you know, the God in all of us, it's recognizing that in, and the other. And I think that's what it's all about to love, but to have experiences too, you know, it's not just, I think, to become aware of our spiritual essence and, and to be present in the moment. I think that's important, of course, but, you know, to have, to have fun, to have relationships, to have jobs that we like, you know, to not spend your, your, days, you know, wasting away at some job that you hate, you know, that's not our purpose, you know, to love your life, to thrive, you know, to have wonderful relationships and wonderful friendships and to be prosperous and, and to enjoy your life where Monday is a good thing. It's not something you hate, you know, and, and it's not just to be present. It's not just to grow in consciousness. It's to grow in, you know, in prosperity and success and, and how you define it. I think the two, it's the humanity and the being, both are necessary, finding that balance, you know. So I have a few more questions for you about this 2020. We have been going through lots of challenges and change. So for you, what have you learned in 2020? Oh, my God. Um, I've learned that um, I'm stronger than I, I knew. You know, it's it's been such a challenging year for everybody. You know, it's such a horrible year um, to not be able to see my my family, you know, and friends as much. And um, and also just all the fear and the terror that we're getting, you know, every day in the news. And, you know, when all this happened, you know, I lost my job, too, you know, for a while. At least I got it back. We got our, our the school that I work at. We got the Paycheck Protection Program. That was wonderful. But, you know, it, it originally we, we lost we lost our jobs originally. Uh, we thought we were going to lose our jobs. And that was terrifying. And, and for so many people experiencing that, you know, it's been a horrible year. It's a terrible year. And it's really shaken me, you know. Um, and I but I've realized, you know, that the things I believe, I, I still believe, you know. Mm. I believe in faith. I believe in God. You know, I believe in the law of attraction. I really do, right. even though I used right. to think it was crazy. But I, mm. I do believe in that. Absolutely. <laughs> And I believe that the world is good and that people are good at their core. And um, mm. I think everything's going to be okay. And, you know, throughout this whole experience, I've just, you know, I've just kept relying on my faith and everything has always just kept working out okay for me throughout this whole experience. It just, you know, every time I focused on positivity, uh, even when I had lost my job, you know, I just focused on abundance. I just focused on faith and belief. And I just kept being happy, forcing myself to be happy. You know, even though the future was so uncertain and everything just keeps working out, you know, things just keep going my way. I really think it's true. And it's so important not to get swept away in the news, you know, and all the fear and all the panic and all the anger and all the divisiveness. You know, it's it's toxic. It's really toxic. And I think you just have to heal yourself, heal yourself, focus on your own well-being. And that's how you're going to heal the world. That's how you're going to make things better. It's not selfish to be happy. It's really not. It's okay to be happy, even when the world seems like it's on fire. What are the principles, the main principles of the law of attraction? 
Well, the idea is that we're all creating our own reality as we move through this sort of field of consciousness that we're, we're all God and that our I amness is creating our experience, you know. Um, so, of course, I first got exposed to this, you know, back in 2006, I watched The Secret, you know, and originally I, I felt like something in it, you know, resonated with me, but it also seemed kind of slick and a little gimmicky. And I just thought this is too good to be true, you know. And so, um, you know, my wife and I, we experimented with those ideas, you know, and we believed it. But, um, you know, then after a few years, we're like, you know, what? this is this is crazy. This stuff is, you know, it's all wishful thinking. You know, you just have to work hard. Grindstone, you know, you know, it's it's got to face the facts, the hard reality of life. Um, but when we did that and we sort of gave up on the whole idea of the law of attraction, we dismissed it as being crazy. You know, our lives became horrible and just really small and very limiting and very scary and fearful. And we became so unhappy. So we came back to it. We came back to it. And I, I discovered Neville Goddard, who um, uh, I think is the greatest spiritual teacher I've ever read. You know, he's either he's either absolutely crazy or he's a spiritual genius. And, uh, you know, I go back and forth, but I really do think he was a spiritual genius. I think he's amazing. And he reinterprets the Bible uh, you know, in, in a whole different way uh, and in terms of the law of attraction and that we're all God, that we're all God, that the Bible is a, a psychological journey, that we're all these are all the characters in the Bible are different um, um, states of consciousness that we can move through. They're just different personifications of states that we all move through and that we're all moving towards that state of Christ consciousness, that we're all moving towards that. And um, that just shook me up, you know, to read that. It just, the whole Bible just became new and alive and dynamic because I, I grew up in, a, in, you know, in the Protestant faith tradition. It, it means so much to me. But I discovered him a couple of years ago and I've been reading him just nonstop and listening to him, you know, on YouTube. And I just, oh, he's wonderful. And that has reinterpreted, made the law of attraction very alive to me. Um, that we create our own reality because we're all God. We're just, we're, we're just, we're all divine, you know, and that there is no external reality and there is no objective reality. And I know that's, that's kind of uh, provocative and, and frightening to some people, but I, I do think there is objective truth. I believe in science. I believe in facts. I believe in objective truth and right and wrong, but I don't think there's an objective reality. I think we're all creating that as we move through this field of consciousness and we are at the center of that. We are all God. The I am within us is God. And then when you say, I am that, that's the sun, that's the sun. And that's the manifestation. That's the Christ. And, and we're all that we're all discovering that within ourselves, the divinity within ourselves. And when you realize that it's like, Oh my gosh, you know, it just, you can, you can really do anything you want. You know, the, the sky's the limit if you really believe. And I, I really do believe that I've seen it in my own life throughout this whole terrible, terrible year is anytime I just focus on my divinity without fear, everything works out. It really does. Everything works out. And I don't think we have to be scared or feel like it's taboo or frightening to admit that we are all divine and just have faith in that. So that's to me what the law of attraction, as I understand it now. Freedom. What is freedom to you? What is to be free finally? So for me, freedom is to realize that you do have a choice, you know, you have a choice as to what thought you're going to think. You have a choice as to what emotion you're going to, you know, engage in. And, and I think when you don't have that choice, you're not free. You're just a bundle of reactions. You know, you're, you're not free until you realize that you have a choice, until you have enough presence power, enough space within you to say, you know what, I'm not going to think this thought. I'm not going to engage this emotion, even though I want to, you know, <laughs> even though I'm angry, even though I want to, it feels good, you know, um, uh, to, to think, wait a second, do I really want to say this? Do I really want to think this? Do I really want to feel this? You know, is this, is this helping me right now? That's freedom to me. And, um, I, and I didn't have that for many years. It wasn't until I got older that I realized I have a choice as to what thought I have and to what emotion I have. And so, that's freedom when you realize you can choose. How did you become a writer? I know I asked, how did you become a musician? But yeah. writing, how did that come into your life? Yeah, well, I've been writing my whole life. I've been writing my whole life and um, just for fun, you know, and mostly in college and, you know, graduate school, I was writing these essays, you know, it was boring. It wasn't any fun, you know, because I had to. Um, and it wasn't until after um, 
after graduate school that I started to write, you know, more humor, uh, more for fun, you know, but, um, uh, I've always been writing as a way to express myself, you know, to be honest, it's just a place where you, I feel I can be totally, completely myself and to be honest. And that to me is like oxygen, you know, because, um, I feel like I notice things, I observe things, you know, so many of us, you know, sensitive people, you know, we, we just, we see so much, you know, and, um, sometimes you're not, it's not polite to say it, you know, mm-hmm, true. <laughs> you can't just say, you can't just say what's on your mind you, know, you can't, you have to be polite in your job and, and with mm-hmm. your relationships, you know, but mm-hmm. in my writing, I, I can be totally honest, you know, and that's, so that it to me is, is just like breathing, you know, I just love it. I, whether people were reading my writing or not, it doesn't matter. I would still be, I'd still be doing it just to process, just to kind of understand the world around me. That connection between your book title, comedy and self-help, how did you connect them? I know it's kind of like two different books in one. Okay. I know. Well, I, th- I think that, you know, you got to have a sense of humor about the difficult things in life. You know, if, if you can hold on to your sense of humor and I've tried to keep my sense of humor in the most difficult things, if you can hold on to that, you can keep your sanity, you know, because uh, our sense of humor, it just keeps us human. It keeps us, you know, it keeps us our perspective on everything. And so the book was um, it started out as just a, a way for me to process this terrible experience I was going through. I had graduated, you know, I'd finished my graduate program in Washington, DC. It was a, it was a bad recession. This was 2003, you know, and I was also just trying to find these jobs that weren't right. I, you know, I was an artist and I was trying to fit in, in this world of politics, of confrontation, and I was losing my mind. You know, it was, it was a, it was a terrible experience. So I had to write about it. And so I wrote about it as a way just to stay sane and to laugh about it. You know, it's, for me, humor is the great way of diffusing tension. So it just, I wrote all these crazy chapters, you know, the early chapters, which are just, you know, sort of outlandish and over the top and just, you know, for fun and as a way to kind of find common ground with that difficult experience of looking for a job. But then as I got more into the book and as I had this experience of you know, moving to California and, and uh, becoming a piano teacher, a musician and, and, you know, putting into practice these ideas of, you know, the law of attraction. And that's how I met my wife and, and everything just became wonderful and miraculous. When I trusted my heart, I thought, you know, I want to put this in the book too. I don't want my book to just be a silly comic, you know, comedic book. I want it to say something too, you know, and I thought, why not combine genres? You know, why can't you be funny and be serious at the same time? So um, that's the book. You know, it starts out as just funny and it's just like, you know, let's enjoy this common experience and how crazy it is. And let's just laugh about, you know, job hunting because it's so stressful. But then I, I wanted to give the reader something, you know, that an insight, what I believe to be true. And so that's where it eventually lands. You know, it, it goes into those later chapters about believing in yourself, imagining, you know, imagination, creating reality, yeah. having faith and believing your hard work, of course, but also, yeah just having faith, believing in the goodness of the universe, not being scared. Talk to me for a moment about the main misconceptions about of job hunting. Well, I think, I think that I, I really don't like things where we're playing roles. You know, it bothers me so much when people are playing roles. I just, I like to be authentic. I like to be real, you know, and my, as my job as a teacher, I try to be real with the students, you know, and I think they like it. They appreciate it, uh, you know, instead of being the teacher, you know, and, and, and job hunting, you know, we fall into these silly roles, you know. I'm the hiring manager and you are the job applicant. I, I, I can't stand that at all. It bothers me so much. Um, so I, I just don't like artifice. I don't like when people play roles, you know, it's it, life is too short to play these roles, you know? And, um, I think there's something about job hunting that invites that, you know, and it also, it, it, it just creates this power dynamic too, which I'm also, I don't like makes me uncomfortable, you know? Um, and uh, so the whole experience to me can be very inauthentic and very, um, fake, very fake. And so that's, that to me is a source of tension and a source for humor. You know, I think humor just when, when you burst the bubble and you say, Hey, this is true. You know, you just say the truth when everybody's lying and you say the truth, that to me is funny, you know, that's funny. So I just try to do that in the book and say, you know what, so much of this is, is kind of crazy, you know, uh, it's crazy. 
we're all, you know, in this together and, you know, everybody is just trying to do their best, you know, hiring managers. And I, I, I had the experience of interviewing people in, in my job, um, uh, where I'm working now at the college where I'm teaching at, I was, I helped out the hiring manager. I, I sat in on these interviews. So I have some experience with that. And, you know, the hiring people, they just want to hire someone. They just, they're doing a job too. They just want to hire someone who is going to be a good at the job, you know? And I, we just, we fall into these roles and we make everything so intimidating and so scary. And it's not that way at all. We're all just people, you know, we're all the same. And so I just tried to focus on that in my book and, and just kind of tell the truth. For me, power is self-discipline. There's something magical that happens when you honor your promises to yourself. And this is what I talk about in the book. And I'm not, you know, I don't always practice what I preach. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm struggling with this too, you know, to go to the gym as often as I want to, you know, to not eat the, you know, the, the chocolate or whatever, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm not, I'm no, you know, I'm no saint at those things. You know, I, I'm, I'm doing the best I can, but um, I find when you honor your promises to yourself, you know, when you really do follow through, oh my gosh, there's something about self-discipline. There is something about that that makes you powerful. You know, when you, it's just so simple when you write a to-do list and then you do it. Oh, it just, everything, it turns the whole day around. You know, it just makes everything, you feel so good. You feel so powerful. You have such a sense of, uh, you know, efficacy. And I think it requires you to do the work, you know, all the resistance, you know, you know, just going to the gym or whatever it is that you're doing. It's so difficult. All these voices like, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? It's not necessary. Why don't you just stay home? You know, uh, you don't really need who do you think you are? You know, um, you have to plow through those or kind of let them go, you know, become translucent to all those negative thoughts. And that's how you become powerful, I think, is when you honor your promises to yourself. And it's so difficult, you know, but I think that that is where power lies. It's self-discipline, honoring your commitments to yourself. It's valuing yourself. And it's mm -hmm. not easy. But I think that's the route to power. The topic that really caught my attention was also believing in yourself. So that is a powerful, important, extremely important message and reminder for all of us. How do we even begin doing that for those who don't have any self-esteem or very low self-esteem and it's always doubting oneself what would you say is the first step in becoming more self-aware and more self-loving yeah so for me this is this is in uh, you know the whole idea in the bible about turning the other cheek i i don't think that has anything to do with you know external conduct and you know if m people are mean to you I, I, you have to stand up for yourself you turning the other cheek has nothing to do with external conduct of your life i think it's very important to stand up for yourself i think that idea of turning the other cheek is to become translucent and yielding to those negative thoughts when they arise. And we all have them, you know, um, especially if you have low self-esteem, you know, and you, when you try and do something positive, you try to go to the gym or, you know, stand up for yourself or do something that affirms your worth, you're going to encounter those voices in your head that are trying to restore equilibrium and homeostasis and say, who do you think you are? You're nobody. You know, you shouldn't go to the gym. You, you shouldn't stand up for yourself. Who, who are you? You know, that's, that's the terrible thing. I think we all have that. And that's when you turn the other cheek, you, I think, inwardly. You become translucent and you become invisible to those thoughts. You arise above them. Because the, if you engage with those thoughts, in my experience, they get worse. You know, they, they just get worse. And you start battling them, you start fighting them, and they become a monster. And then you don't go to the gym and you don't do the thing that, that helps you. So for me, um, I just sort of become invisible. I try to rise above those thoughts. And it's not like a tough thing. It's like a yielding. It's a very soft kind of um, passive sort of, uh, you know, a, a very soft process of like, oh, no, I see those thoughts and I just let them go right through me. And then I'm able to do that thing that I promised I would, you know, uh, whatever it is that makes me feel better about myself. So I think that's uh, what it is. It's to be soft and translucent and invisible when you are barraged by those negative thoughts, as we all are, I think. 
Oh yes. Oh yes, absolutely. I, I, yes, I need to, <laughs> I need to, cause, cause I have such an active mind, you know, like everybody else I get, I get swept away, especially now, um, with all the terrible, you know, you know, just reading the news, you know, it, it can make you so sad and so angry and so depressed. So absolutely. I do. I do try to practice meditation all the time and, and not in like a special way, not like to sit and do, I mean, I know there's a place for that, but for me, it's, Anytime I'm bombarded with negative thoughts, that to me is a meditation to say, I'm not going to engage with those thoughts. I'm going to rise above those thoughts. I, I am bigger than my thoughts, uh, you know, to find that consciousness above the thoughts. That's the meditation. And I, I do that all the time, especially when I, I you know, when I want to write or I want to, you know, practice music or go to the gym, then I really have to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you still watch the news or have you stopped? I, I, tr I, I have been, you know, um, but I'm, I'm, I try, I, you know, I think it's important to be informed, of course, but, yeah. but not inundated, not inundated right. with negativity. I, I, yeah. We all, I mean, of course, it matters what's happening in the world and, and you have to know what's going on and participate in the collective, of course. But I think yeah. I, I try, I find I'm so much happier when I don't engage with it, uh, you know, when I don't focus on it, because then I can actually make a difference in my life. It, it, you know, it's like that whole Stephen Covey, he talks about the circle of influence and the circle of concern. And we're all concerned about what's happening, you know, nationally, but in terms of our circle of influence, where can we actually make a difference? It's as, a, you know, a husband, you know, as a friend, as a son, you know, and, and that's where I feel like you really make a difference. And you're better able to make a difference when you're not being barraged with toxic energy you know so right now i'm really trying not to read the news uh, so that i can be more active and be a better person and also just to protect my own inner space yeah i think you talked just now about uh this uh, detachment in a way or this awareness about our thoughts and negative thoughts is that what you call non-reactivity yes absolutely okay. Absolutely. Yeah, non-reactivity. So that's the same topic. I love when you talk about being kind, being generous, being idealistic, are not weak qualities, right? Because is that old saying about kindness being seen as weakness? Yes, right? I know, they say, you know, nice guys finish last. I don't think it's true. I think there's so many people who, uh, there's, you're, people are so afraid of being accused of being naive that we, we swing to the other side of the pendulum and we, we want to prove how tough we are, how skeptical we are, how cynical we are, how jaded we are. But I, I don't, I think that's folly, you know? I think, you know, to maintain your kindness and your hopefulness and your idealism in this world that it can be so jaded, you know, being jaded is not strength, you know, being cynical, being angry, it's not strength because, you know, we, we create our own reality. If you want to see the world in a cynical way, then that's the world that I believe you will experience. But if you want to see the world as beautiful, as filled with, you know, hope and love and kindness and friendship and, and just benevolence, then that's the world you will experience. And I would much prefer to live in that world. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I try to do. I have a few more questions for you. They are the final ones. Would you like to add anything? No, no, gosh, it's been, this is, <laughs> I've gotten a lot off my chest here. It's, been, <laughs> it's really fun to have this talk. I, you know, I don't, I don't always, you know, get to talk about these things, um, you know, uh, at, at my workplace, certainly. <laughs> so it's really fun to, to talk with you. I really enjoy this. Thank you. Two more questions. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything in a different way? No, no, and I'm I'm absolutely uh, happy to say that because you know I I'm aware I am aware of my mortality and so I try to be fearless you know yeah, yeah. and I don't I don't make decisions based on fear right. so you know um, yeah I'd be happy um, I'm happy with with who I am and I'm happy with the choices I've made so yeah no regrets no regrets. And my last question is: What are three things about life you know for sure as of now? So number one is that my wife loves me. <laughs> yeah. So lucky to say that. I'm really blessed. I'm really blessed to have such a great relationship with my wife. That's number one. Um, my family loves me. My parents, they're great mm -hmm. parents and they love me. Um, and number three, I just know that we're all 
divine. I really believe that we are all God and we're just beginning to realize that uh, collectively. And I just know it. I just know it that we're all divine and there's really nothing to be scared of when you realize that. Um, so those are the three things. Thank you so much again, Carl, for your beautiful unique and genuine presence. The work you do, your beautiful message, powerful reminder to all of us. Thank you again. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Valeria. I've really enjoyed it. It's been so much fun. And and thank you for all the positive energy you're putting out there. I think your podcast and your books are just beautiful. And I think the world needs more of this positivity. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Yeah, so it's McCoyWriting.com. Uh, that's my website, McCoyWriting.com. Um, yeah, just go there, and I have uh, blogs and um, books. I have a new book I just uh, published. It's about imagination and about the law of attraction and about um, all these things, about healing yourself. Um, it's called Island of Imagination. That's my new book. And uh, yeah, just check out um, McCoyWriting.com. That's my website. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Yes, uh, thank you so much. This has been really fun, and I look forward to talking with you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Carl McCoy and his work, please visit McCoyWriting.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.